We are so mature that, Mr. Speaker, we gave ourselves the most modern constitution in recent history 14 years ago. We are so mature that seven years ago, we had the nullification of the only Order, presidential election. Order, honorable senators. Senator Fonandi, take your seat. Senator Kipsang, may the counsel for the National Assembly be heard in silence. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Seven years ago, we had the nullification of the only presidential election known to history. And today, Mr. Speaker, we are conducting impeachment proceedings unknown to this continent outside of the removal proceedings in a parliamentary system in South Africa. Mr. Speaker, I want to thank you and the Senate for demonstrating the maturity of a democracy. So much so that even when the deputy president is unable to appear without anything on record, this honorable Senate has accorded the deputy speaker the opportunity, the deputy, the deputy president, the opportunity for his counsel to be present and they have voluntarily exited. The right to appear in person or by counsel is a right under Article 145. But like every other right, you can choose to exercise it or not to exercise it. The idea and the fact of this impeachment proceedings being in open as they are and being so democratic even to vote on the procedural motion shows how mature our country has become. Mr. Speaker, before the 2010 Constitution, we would not have been here for this process for two days. We would not have been taking this process in the National Assembly. The president would sack the vice president at whims, including for not liking the color of his shoes. The fact that we are here in a situation where to impeach a deputy president, we have to go through these processes. Mr. Speaker, it shows our maturity. But let it not be mistaken, Mr. Speaker, as some people have, that the process of impeachment is a criminal trial. When you hear people ask the mover of the motion, do you have any proof? Can you demonstrate? It means they are confusing this process with a criminal process. It is not a criminal process. Mr. Speaker, what we have in impeachment is a halfway house between the whim before 2010 and the beyond reasonable doubt proof in a criminal trial. In the words of Article 50, all you have to show is reason to believe. Reason to believe what the lawyers would call just a prima facie case. You do not have to demonstrate beyond reasonable doubt. So all the questions that I had my learned friends putting to the mover to prove, to demonstrate, they look good to the public gallery, but they add no value to the test for impeachment. Mr. Speaker, impeachment is like a vote of confidence or a vote of no confidence. Just the same way when you vote the president and the deputy, no one asks you to justify why, because you exercise your discretion. When you lose that confidence, no one should ask you to demonstrate why. That is why it's a political process. Otherwise, it could have been a judicial process or a religious process. Mr. Speaker, it is important to make two distinctions. First, that in this process, you do not have to prove anything beyond reasonable doubt. That's number one. The beyond reasonable doubt can come later when the other processes come in, like the investigative agencies. Number two, Mr. Speaker, in courts, our courts use an adversarial system where you bring all the documents and you are restricted to what you have brought. The process in this house is inquisitorial, under Article 145 all the way to 149. And therefore, it allows this house to go beyond what the mover has brought or beyond what the other witnesses have brought. And this House has exercised that jurisdiction quite maturely. Mr. Speaker, I want to suggest that the idea of impeachment is one which is, a legal, is legal in process only, legal in process, but political in content and merit. As long as all the legal processes for fair hearing are observed, it is not open to anyone to question the merit in terms of the decision of the National Assembly or this Senate, because the safeguard is in the numbers. That is why before you move it in the National Assembly, you need 117 members. For it to pass, you need at least two thirds. Even in this house, you need two thirds. That is the safeguard. The safeguard is not in the legal technicalities. Mr. Speaker, 
For that reason, while it looks juicy and it looks very good to the gallery, to have that intense cross-examination such as we saw of the move of the motion, Mr. Speaker, it is irrelevant. It is highly relevant, and to the untrained eye, they might think you are achieving much, but you are not achieving much. It must be remembered that the impeachment here is of the deputy president, not the mover of the motion. So however much you discredit the mover of the motion, you do your client no justice when you do not address the substance of what is moved. Mr. Speaker, allow me to refocus on Article 150. Article 150 makes a very important distinction. And I heard the lawyers of the deputy president saying that, um, you know, there's precedent. There is no precedent in our courts in terms of impeachment. There's precedent in terms of removal from office of governors under Article 181. The word used is removal. The word impeachment does not appear in Article 181. But when you come to Article 150, two words are used. You can remove the deputy president first, Mr. Speaker, under 151A, under 151 is removal. To that extent, the question of removal in 151, you can use the same standards in Article 181. But B, it says, or on impeachment. There is no other provision for impeachment, and we have not undertaken impeachment in this country. For that reason, Mr. Speaker, while the wording might look similar, the principles are different. Because for removal, for example, under 151, it's a strict legal process. You have to show and demonstrate that the deputy president, uh, you know, has physical or mental incapacity. But when it comes to impeachment, it's a different matter. It's more of a political matter. Mr. Speaker, impeachment is a demonstration of impropriety, of unfitness for office, of its taking political responsibility. Indeed, Mr. Speaker, it, in a representative democracy, it is the way of unvoting someone you had voted. Otherwise, you would be having a fresh election to decide, should we now remove this person from office? It is too expensive. The fact, Mr. Speaker, that you have 82% in the National Assembly voting for impeachment, and two-thirds, if it succeeds in this House, you translate it to the millions that it represents. In the National Assembly, 82% translate to about 40 2 million out of the 50 million Kenyans. That is a significant number. Mr. Speaker, if this House is equally to vote, you translate it to the equivalent number of people it's representing. It is not a heavy matter. If it was any less, it would have been a decision for a single judge. Mr. Speaker, allow me to address two things, then I sit, in terms of substance. One, you have 11 charges. Four of those charges oscillate around one issue, and that is the utterances by the deputy president and the charges he made insightful and discriminatory uh, utterances to the effect that only those who voted for the Kenya Kwanzaa are entitled to resources and positions in government in Kenya. That is the summary of that charge. That charge is contained in ground one, ground five, ground six, and ground ten. I want to submit, Mr. Speaker, that if you find even only that one charge to have been satisfied, then I want to implore the senators to vote yes for all those four grounds together. Has it been satisfied? Mr. Speaker, those utterances are admitted by the deputy president in the documents before you. The meanings of those words in their variety is known to you and is known to Kenyans. The danger in words is something we know in this country way back in 2007. In our neighboring country, Rwanda, we know what words did. I heard the lawyers of the deputy president suggest that he did not take any action. Under the law, under Article 10, under Article 27, you do not have to take any action. Utterances are enough, because utterances can do the very damage that the Constitution intends not to be done. Mr. Speaker, what is his um, response to that charge? There are two. The first one is he was exercising free speech. Mr. Speaker, that is the easiest to dismiss. I invite the senators to look at Article 33, 
2D Roman 2. It is expressed and it says freedom of expression cannot include advocacy for discrimination. And that's what he was doing. What's the second defense? That whatever he was saying is contained in the various uh, you know, coalition agreements under the Kenya Kwanzaa coalition that were filed and signed before election. Mr. Speaker, with tremendous respect, allow me to remind the Deputy President that this is the Republic of Kenya, not the Republic of Kenya Kwanzaa. Mr. Speaker, for that reason, you cannot elevate agreements under the Kenya Kwanzaa coalition above the legislation of this country, above the constitution of this country. Section 13 of the NCIC Act is very clear that those utterances are unlawful, in fact, criminal. Article 10 and Article 27 of the Constitution are equally clear that you cannot make such utterances. So to come and say that I uttered them because they are contained in a coalition for one particular political coalition is in fact an admission. It is an admission of violation of the Constitution. And Mr. Speaker, if members wanted one clear admission of guilt, it is this one. It is not denied. The justification cannot stand. And indeed, Mr. Speaker, once one of the senators asked uh, you know, for the uh, justification, and I had the lawyers refer to the Schedule 3 of the Political Parties uh, Act. Mr. Speaker, I invite the senators to look at Schedule 3, Clause 3E. It is very specific. It talks of sharing positions in the coalition structure, not sharing positions in government. And to try and mislead this August House makes it an aggravation of a wrong. And I invite you, Mr. Speaker, to find that there was a breach of this. And I think the worst of all is we were able to play a clip of the deputy president after being showing what he had uttered, saying that he has no apology. He said he has no apology. The clip was paid here. I invite you to look at the 798 pages that he has filed. There is nowhere where he has rendered an apology. So he leaves you in a position where he says, even if he was not impeached, he will continue doing that because in his view, it is justified by the Kenya Kwanzaa coalition. Mr. Speaker, I invite the honorable senators to find that this ground has been proved and to impeach the deputy president on ground one, ground five, ground six, and ground 10 for breach of the NCIC Act, section 13, and breach of article 10 and 27 of the constitution. My last point, Mr. Speaker, allegations of corruption. Mr. Speaker, this house has had the various allegations of corruption. You had the very direct evidence of Dr. Mulwa in terms of Kemsa. You had the very direct evidence of the deputy CEO of ESCC. You had the various evidence in terms of Olive Garden, Vipingo, Outfan, and many others. But I will not go there. I will let you assess that, and my colleagues will address that. I want to address one fundamental thing. In your bundle, honorable senators, in volume 2A of the exhibit, you will find reference to a particular court decision. This is the decision on page 60 of 123. That is the decision in Asset Recovery Agencies versus Rigadi Gachagua. This decision was referred to, but I just want to take you directly to the finding on page 77. This was a case that the Asset Recovery Agency filed against the Deputy President. And this case was actually finalized 10 days before the last general election. What did the court find? The court found positively and declared that Rigadi Gachagua was found to have been having funds which were proceeds of crime and therefore liable for forfeiture to the state to the extent of 200 million. Mr. Speaker, it is important to note 
that in the 798 pages of the document filed by the deputy president, there is not a single document that shows that this judgment has been set aside, has been compromised or revoked. In an inquisitorial system, you do not need to restrict yourself. Where there's a judgment produced that shows that you have been found guilty of having proceeds of crime, the expectation would be that you would produce a document negating it. The fact that no document has been produced, I invite you to invoke an adverse inference that either there is no such document, or if there is, it does not deal with the, that finding. Mr. Speaker, I want to submit that there is good reason why that document was not produced. Why would you produce all the agreements of Kenya Kwanzaa and produce all sorts of other things except one page of a document that is the most important document? As it is, you do not have any document that shows that this finding was negated. Mr. Speaker, I want to suggest that had it been produced, we would then have demonstrated that that document is unlawful. Because in law, and I submit respectfully, once you've been, have, you have been found guilty of what amounts to a criminal offense, you cannot then subsequently compromise it. Because this is not a civil claim. A crime is a crime against the state. It is not personal to the Asset Recovery Agency. And therefore, those findings can only be set aside by positive findings of a superior court, and there's none. So the record shows that Gadi Gachagua was convicted of corruption. And what that means, Mr. Speaker, that not only was he con uh, convicted, but even to come here and allege that he was convicted and thereafter you know, they entered some sort of negotiation, is in itself evidence of abuse of power. Because he was convicted and 10 days before elect election, shortly thereafter, it is alleged they compromised it in what would be an illegality. Mr. Speaker, on that account, ground seven of the charge must succeed. Respectfully, Mr. Speaker, honorable senators, I plead with you to find the deputy president guilty of the grounds as charged. Thank you very much. Allow me now to introduce the Honorable George Murugara to take over. <clears throat> Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker and Honorable Senators. Uh, my name is George Kitonga Murugara, Member of Parliament, National Assembly, and the Chairperson of the Justice and Legal Affairs and I'm here to represent the National Assembly with my colleagues. Honorable Speaker and Senators, <clears throat> I'll deal with only one point which supports ground number 11 on the impeachment. And the ground 11 is insubordination